Hello everyone, welcome back. This is Professor Casey. Today we're discussing Chapter 29 of David Emery Shy's America, A Narrative History. Uh, this particular chapter deals with the decade of the 1960s, okay? Um, and most people have a, a pretty clear idea in mind of what the 1960s entails, okay? Some may have lived through it, some of you have parents who have lived through it. Um, and uh, so anyway, what we're talking about here is basically the, the social and political uh, events that occurred during the 60s. Uh, we won't really get into the counterculture movement until we get to the next chapter or so, uh, but for now we'll deal with at least the major um, socio-political events that occur. So the 1960s is really the biggest um, decade of social upheaval that we have during the 20th century, okay? So many different events are occurring all at the same time that it begins to change how the American public views itself, how people tend to view each other, uh, and how the public and the government tend to interact with one another as well. Okay. Of course, we have the civil rights movement that is now reaching its apex during the 1960s. Okay, It had its beginnings in the late 1950s, and now that we're getting into the 60s, especially and toward the end of the decade, things really begin to boil over. Of course, the conflict in Vietnam becomes one of the biggest talking, uh, talking points during the 60s. Okay, Again, just like uh, with the civil rights movement, another event that occurred during the 1950s and, again, increases in intensity during the 60s. And of course, the counterculture movement is now on the uprising. Okay, we uh, had the beginnings of it with the beatniks in the 1950s, and as we get more and more into the 60s and even into the 70s, we see the counterculture movement, the hippies in particular, begin to take on much more uh, social prominence over time. Okay, so we will talk a little bit more about them once we get into the next chapter. When it comes to the election of 1960, now that we have gotten past the decade of the 50s, America has started to bounce back a little bit economically speaking, uh, and we're gradually shifting back into a more um, conservative sphere of society when it comes to leadership and the White House. Um, of course, uh, Dwight Eisenhower's health has already begun to fail him uh, the further along he's gotten into his second term in office. And so by the time 1960 rolls around, he served two full terms, and he has decided to step down as, uh, as the front runner here. And so Republicans end up nominating his vice president, Richard Nixon, who you see here. Okay. Um, and Nixon has a, a track record of being a very, very ambitious man, okay, and uh, something that ends up coming back to uh, bite him, really, later on in his uh, political career. Uh, it ends up causing him to go into a very sharp downward spiral over time. Uh, but he is not above, uh, you know, using whatever uh, means to uh, politicize himself and others to get ahead in, in life. And in many cases, he's actually at odds with Dwight Eisenhower, even while he's vice president. Um, he and Eisenhower don't always see eye to eye when it comes to uh, foreign policy, when it comes to domestic policy. Um, and in many cases, uh, Nixon is actually in danger of being fired by Eisenhower because the two don't get along very well. Okay. Uh, and uh, Eisenhower constantly actually threatens to replace Nixon uh, just simply because Nixon is very much in the right wing sphere of things, whereas Eisenhower is still trying to maintain this middle of the road presidency. And in terms of his personal character, aside from his ambition, uh, Nixon has been uh, lampooned multiple times since as being an individual who's extremely awkward, very stiff, uh, and just unsure of himself in general. Right? He doesn't really carry himself with a whole lot of uh, physical presence, right? He tends to have this kind of hunched over, um, uh, miserly attitude over time. And again, once uh, once we start to see uh, political satire and social satire in the, in the coming decade or so really start to take a forefront, Nixon really bears the brunt of a lot of jokes. The Democratic Party, meanwhile, though, actually ends up nominating a 43-year-old uh, Massachusetts senator in the person of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Okay. Uh, and Kennedy is everything that Richard Nixon is not. Okay, uh, Nixon, uh, of course, is now getting on in years. He's in his uh, probably in his late 40s or early 50s by this point, and Kennedy is extremely young by comparison. Okay, and his character is actually the polar opposite of what Nixon's is as well. Okay, whereas Nixon is very awkward and socially uh, kind of a, a misfit in certain regards, uh, Kennedy is very charismatic. He's young. He's pragmatic. And, uh, and he seems very level-headed when it comes to politics, right? He seems to have a lot of experience with it. 
Uh, and he also has uh, a nice track record going back to World War II. He served in the Navy and was an actual officer on board a naval ship. He's Harvard educated. Uh, and uh, his running mate is actually uh, Lyndon Johnson, the senator from Texas, who ultimately ends up replacing Kennedy once the assassination occurs. And Lyndon Johnson, if you recall, was an individual who actually pushed the, the Civil Rights Acts uh, through Congress back in the 1950s when Eisenhower was in office. So Kennedy and Johnson seem to be uh, kind of a match made in heaven when it comes to, at least on the outside anyway, when it comes to these particular um, uh, items of administration. In September of 1960, Kennedy and Nixon actually had the first uh, presidential debate that's ever broadcast live on television. Okay, And the image that you see in the background here is, is a screenshot taken from that. Uh, this is something that can actually be found on YouTube. You can watch it yourself. It's, it's black and white, obviously. But um, And the in the particular debate, it's something that is uh, very interesting to watch because uh, the two of them really start to show their, their character much more to the general public. Uh, early on in the um, in the entire debate, okay, Kennedy is very cool, calm, and collected. Has really uh, measured responses to things, and Nixon is constantly fidgeting. He's sweating profusely. Uh, he's uncomfortable. So it's easy to see uh, how Americans can really start to look at the candidates, even from the comfort of their own home, and decide who they really like. The next morning, unsurprisingly, because Kennedy has such a great performance in this, his approval ratings end up skyrocketing. Okay. So Kennedy becomes uh, very much uh, the favorite over time in America to actually lead the nomination. Uh, and uh, his father, Joseph Kennedy, actually has a reputation uh, as being um, the, the one who really fosters his son's image here. And Joseph Kennedy has his own background as being a former ambassador to Great Britain when FDR was president. Uh, and Joe Kennedy also has a reputation of being kind of a, a political mover and shaker himself. He, he operates very much behind the scenes uh, and uh, really tries to foster all of his son's political uh, achievements. He had several sons, all of whom have had long records in politics since. And Kennedy himself is a very tireless campaigner. He goes on uh, book signing tours. He goes on uh, speaking tours, uh, gives several speeches when it comes to the, um, uh, the presidential race and so forth. And he has to defend himself several times here. Okay, uh, Ends up making speeches, 350 of them in 25 different states over the course of the campaign itself. Um, and one of the big controversies surrounding Kennedy and something that hasn't really come to the forefront in American politics really yet during the uh, 20th century is the fact that Kennedy is actually a Roman Catholic. Okay, And the reason why this is such a big controversy, it doesn't seem like it would be, um, is the fact that um, – uh, Nixon himself is actually considered a Protestant. He he belongs to the Quakers, okay. And the Quakers are supposedly a, a very you know uh, pacifist, peaceful Protestant sect of Christianity. Of course, if you take in the the first part of history, uh, they had their origins back in Pennsylvania, back during colonial times, right? And uh, the difference between the two ends up almost being pitched as a difference between two, two different versions of Christianity. And the fact that Kennedy himself is a Roman Catholic indicates that he could potentially um, be beholden to a, a, a world power that's outside of the United States in, in the form of the Vatican. Okay, uh, uh, Nixon over time continues to foster the argument. He doesn't always directly make it, but uh, the the Protestant evangelical sect of Christianity in America, and especially in the South, accuse Kennedy of being a papist, basically saying that if he gets in office, he's going to choose the Pope and the Vatican over the U.S. Constitution. Okay, that he is somehow going to um, basically become some kind of a traitor to the cause of the United States over time. Okay, and it's it's. It's more of a conspiracy theory than anything else. It's obviously something that uh, Kennedy is not dedicated to in that specific regard, uh, more so than anything because of the Cold War, especially people are concerned that Kennedy is somehow going to give up the sovereignty of the United States to the Pope, to the Vatican, or potentially give some kind of state secrets away. Okay? So this is obviously – it's a, 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 an atmosphere of paranoia that people in the country begin to have. So the entire um, uh, period when Kennedy is actually uh, 
campaigning for the presidency here, uh, there are several evangelical ministers, including Billy Graham, among others, who are constantly preaching politics from the pulpit and trying to get people to actually vote for Nixon instead, saying that you know Kennedy is associated with the, the Catholic Church, potentially with communism, with anarchism, with all kinds of other things that he really isn't associated with at all. Okay, so it's a it's an underlying controversy that doesn't get a whole lot of attention these days, but was a big deal at the time. And one of the big things that grants uh, Kennedy uh, the nomination, and especially the election in the long run, is the fact that he is actually a, a supporter of the civil rights movement, and especially Martin Luther King. Okay, he gets Martin Luther King released from a jail in Georgia during the midst of the election, and a lot of black voters start to turn out in favor of Kennedy. And he ends up winning one of the closest elections in U.S. history as a direct result of it. Uh, 68 million people cast a vote during the election, and Kennedy wins by a margin of just under um, 119,000. Okay, so it's, it's the, one of the slimmest margins that we ever see. And 70% of black votes go to Kennedy here. So they are quite, uh, quite frankly one of the main reasons why he gets into office in the first place. And the Kennedy administration ends up setting a couple of new precedents, okay? For one thing, not only is he the first Roman Catholic president we have in America, but also he's the youngest president now, okay? He's broken the record of previous presidents uh, who have been at the age of 46. Kennedy is at 43, okay? So he is still the youngest president that we have at this point. Um, and his primary platform, of course, is to defend the freedom and the sovereignty of the U.S. and the Constitution and try to reduce friction with the Soviet Union as much as he can. Okay? And this is unfortunately a promise that doesn't quite come to fulfillment uh, anytime soon. And in fact, it's quite the opposite when it comes to Kennedy's short-lived administration. Um, and despite the fact that Kennedy is a young man, he actually has a lot of physical and medical problems that actually are going on in the background while he's in office. Um, for one thing, he suffers from Addison's disease. This is a, a withering of the adrenal glands, right? The adrenal glands are what sit on top of the kidneys uh, and basically cause him to uh, lose stamina uh, over time, right? He has to actually take uh, medication shots in some cases to actually keep going on a regular basis to keep his strength up. He also suffers in some cases from venereal disease. He's known for being a rather uh, promiscuous president, um, despite the fact that he is married throughout his presidency. Um, he is quoted at least a, behind closed doors in one case as saying to a senator that he basically has a woman in every single state. Okay, so uh, despite Kennedy's outward appearance as being kind of this heroic young president, he still has a few skeletons in his closet. Uh, he also has chronic back pain due to a birth defect that caused, uh, I think it was a couple of um, uh, plates in his spine to actually either fuse together in some place or to have some kind of friction between them. I can't remember exactly what it is. Uh, he also suffers from chronic fevers, uh, and sometimes he takes injections either daily or sometimes even hourly to, to combat a lot of these different things. Uh, and some of them have to do with a degenerative bone disease he also has. He suffers from uh, social anxiety, from allergies, sleep problems, lots of different things actually plague him. So uh, while he is actually you know, on the forefront of a lot of things, all of this is still going on in the background and is uh, relatively hidden from the American public well after his death. And again, he has this reputation over time as being very, very promiscuous. Um, he obviously has a history with uh, Marilyn Monroe, who you see here at the top, very famous American actress, uh, and also with a, uh, a former mafia mistress named Judith Campbell Exner. Okay? And this is obviously not really a, uh, a good relationship that you want to get involved with, especially if you're the president. You don't want to get involved in, uh, with the mafia if you can keep from it. Um, but despite all of this, despite all the, the you know, innumerable women that he actually carries on affairs with, he does remain married to his wife, Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy, here until his death. Uh, and his entire um, uh, domestic policy, the, the name for the domestic program that he comes up with, is something called the New Frontier. Okay? Uh, and it's roadblocked almost immediately as soon as he gets into office uh, by Congress in particular. Okay? Uh, for one thing, because he has such a narrow election margin here, uh, there's really no mandate. The, the public really doesn't come overwhelmingly to his side, right? The country is very evenly divided in this case. So he doesn't really gain a whole lot of overwhelming support for the different uh, civil rights initiatives and other social initiatives that he comes up with. 
Um, he has several conservative Democrats and Republicans who all join together against him in Congress. Okay? Even though the Democrats have a large presence in the South, again, this is still before the time period when people uh, begin to move toward the Democratic or move toward the Republican Party in the South. Right? Uh, Republicans are not all conservatives at this point, and Democrats are not all liberal at this point in time either. Okay, So we're still in the midst of this social shift. And for a person like Kennedy, who is actually a liberal Democrat, it doesn't exactly come out in favor of him yet. But he does have a few gains in his first few years in office. Okay? He manages to get the approval of a minimum wage increase for all Americans. Uh, he, pa he gets a housing act that's passed that pledges $5 billion to new uh, housing projects in inner cities. Okay, So we're still trying to bridge that gap, even though it's something that never quite uh, comes to full fruition. Uh, and he creates the Peace Corps. Okay, this is one of the uh, the biggest feathers in his cap, at least for the first few years of his administration. Here, uh, it creates it in 1961, and it's a way for um, young, educated uh, college students, idealistic volunteers, to go overseas and provide either uh, technical service, building houses, providing education to third world countries. Okay, again, in this case, third world still refers to countries that are not allied with the United States or the Soviet Union. So, going to South America, perhaps. To African countries, places like that, where technology hasn't quite caught up with the rest of the world just yet. Uh, the Alliance for Progress is another uh, group that has actually begun under Kennedy. Uh, this provides financial assistance to Latin American countries, basically to try to sponsor them and make the U.S. Uh, and capitalism seem more appealing to communism. Okay, so it's a it, than communism, I should say. So, in other words, trying to uh, economically push communism out of the way. And he commits uh, $40 billion also to put a man on the moon within the next 10 years, okay? because NASA has only been in operation for the past two years. Uh, it's a pretty, um, you know, pretty steep thing for him to actually come up with. And we do manage to put a man on the moon uh, by 1969. Okay? So Kennedy, unfortunately, doesn't live to see it, uh, but it is something that is managed to uh, come to fruition after his death. 1961, though, the Soviets actually managed the first manned space flight. Okay, so this is, again, something where the U.S. still feels like it's being left out in the cold because the Soviets have already um, begun to develop this kind of technology. They put a man in, into orbit, uh, they put animals into orbit, and obviously they've launched Sputnik already. Now, in 1959, before Kennedy actually comes into office, and while um, we see... Um, uh, Dwight Eisenhower actually on his way out the door, Fidel Castro seizes control of Cuba. Okay? And this is uh, a major turning point for uh, America's relation with Cuba because it sends us down, uh, quite honestly, down the drain for the better part of half of a century when it comes to relations with Cuba. Um, Fidel Castro himself is actually a communist uh, revolutionary who seizes control of the country through two years of guerrilla warfare. Okay. Uh, and he manages to th overthrow a, a dictator that has been sponsored by the U.S. in the form of Fulgencio Batista. Okay. So Batista is outed, uh, and now Castro has taken over. And if you recall, under Eisenhower with the CIA and so forth, the CIA had come in and actually was actually taking control of these um, uh, dictators, toppling them, and putting new totalitarian regimes that are sponsored by the U.S. in their place. And uh, it seems like Castro kind of beats the U.S. to this. Okay, uh, He ends up overthrowing a dictator and installs himself as the ruler in the meantime. Uh, and Castro is very eager to accept the support of the Soviet Union. And this is a, a potential problem, a very big one for the United States, because Cuba, the island itself, is only about 100 miles off the coast of Florida, okay, give or take. Right? It's, it's extremely close to the U.S. border, and especially because it's in the Western Hemisphere. Okay? This is still uh, – we still have things like the Monroe Doctrine to take into consideration here. Is this a, a European power that is trying to actually gain a foothold in, uh, in North America and so forth or in the Western Hemisphere? So there's a lot of potential uh, long-term issues that could potentially happen here. And because Castro himself is a Soviet enthusiast and because he's already proven that he will take things by force, uh, it seems like it's only a matter of time before he's going to engage with the U.S. as well. 
And when Eisenhower is still in office in January of 1961, he still – he ends up suspending all diplomatic relations with Cuba before Kennedy can even be sworn into office within the next couple of months. Okay, so as soon as Kennedy comes into office, he admit – he ends up inheriting all of uh, the Eisenhower administration's problems with Cuba. Okay. So um, – and in the meantime, Eisenhower has already put a new CIA – sponsored operation in place. Okay, so this is another problem that Kennedy in, ends up inheriting, and it's not something that can really be um, necessarily attributed to him fully. Okay, in part, it's the Eisenhower administration that's responsible for this. Um, but the CIA starts training a force of Cuban refugee, refugees to try to come in and stage a coup, an armed coup, and end up uh, outing Castro altogether, okay, to try to bring uh, Cuba back under the sway of the United States. And when JFK learns of it, uh, he ends up deciding to go ahead and go through with it because he seems like this is something that Eisenhower um, already had in mind, that this is something that had been under uh, – and planning for a long time, and maybe it's something that could potentially work. Okay? So 1,500 different Cubans who were trained uh, in Guatemala to oust Castro, they're trained in Guatemala, in Texas, and in Florida to all land in Cuba in, a, in an amphibious invasion and stage a coup to try to overthrow Fidel Castro altogether. Uh, it's codenamed Operation Trinidad, okay, and it's expected to go in, and people who are uh, civilians in Cuba are expected to rise up and uh, overthrow Castro together, that, uh, basically saying that not everyone in Cuba is a Castro supporter. Okay? On April 17th, uh, these Cuban insurgents end up landing using American ships uh, just before dawn in southern Cuba at a place called the Bay of Pigs. Okay, And the Bay of Pigs is the name given to the incident that follows here. Unfortunately, Castro learns of the invasion beforehand, and he has forces waiting in ambush for uh, the Cuban insurgents when they land. Okay, 1,200 rebels are captured, and the rest of them are killed. So uh, about 300 men are killed, and the rest of them are captured. Uh, and Kennedy ends up panicking because he does not expect this to go uh, afoul. Okay? He expects this to work. And instead of rendering military support to the insurgents to back them up, he basically abandons them here and has to uh, come out and actually admit defeat to the American public because Castro knows exactly what has happened and is telling the rest of the world about it. Uh, and this is another failure of the United States government during this period because of the CIA. And the U.S. actually has to pay $53 million to end up ransoming the prisoners over time. Okay? Uh, so, you know, first rattle out of the hat within the first few months of Kennedy's administration, he already has to admit uh, that he has uh, been part of a failed operation, right, and a major international incident, okay? And it immediately pits the U.S. and Cuba against one another for the remainder of Kennedy's administration. And again, for the better part of the 20th century, Cuba still, uh, and even into the 21st century, Cuba still has issues with the United States. Uh, and the CIA thinks that Kennedy is eventually going to pledge military support and is going to try to follow through with it, but instead he ends up abandoning it instead. Okay? Uh, and he actually orders that nuclear warheads be installed in Turkey on the border of the Soviet Union to try to act as some kind of a deterrent, right? kind of as a, uh, a threat of some sort. Another major incident that occurs in the first year of Kennedy's administration is the construction of the Berlin Wall. Um, in June of 1961, Kennedy actually goes to Vienna and meets with Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet premier. Um, and Khrushchev already has a reputation of steamrolling over anybody he meets, especially if it's a leader of a Western country and the United States in particular. And he does the exact same thing with Kennedy. Okay, he comes in and says that communism is greater than capitalism and that he is going to eventually end up taking over all of Berlin and basically uh, just threatens the United States and says, try and stop me. And so what Kennedy does is he goes back to the U.S. and he requests uh, an estimate of casualties in the event that the U.S. and the Soviet Union come to blows, okay? especially when it comes to nuclear warfare. 
and the estimate that is given uh, in in hindsight is probably very very low. Seventy million people who are estimated to be killed by the the nuclear blasts and the potential fallout. And remember, we're still dealing with hydrogen bombs here, and both countries, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, have these at their disposal. Okay, um, the. Uh, John Foster Dulles, who worked with Eisenhower, still has a little bit of clout in politics at this point, and so this is still something that is fulminating in the background. People are still wanting this to happen in a certain regard. And so Kennedy immediately goes to Congress and starts asking for additional spending on defense in the, in the event that a nuclear exchange, as it's known, ends up occurring. And so 150,000 members of the Army Reserve and National Guard are called up and sent to West Berlin to protect it in the event of a Soviet invasion. Okay. Um, and he also orders that an armed military convoy actually travel from West Germany to Berlin as a show of force to the Soviets to basically flex the U.S. Uh, military's muscles in the face of the Soviet Union. A okay. little bit of posturing here uh, and a little bit of idle threats at the same time. On August 13th, the Soviets end up halting all traffic between East and West Berlin, and they begin construction of the Berlin Wall. Okay, this is what separates East and West Berlin in a 27-mile long um, barrier. Okay, and the Berlin Wall initially, when it's constructed, is very, very small and very flimsy. It's only made up of barbed wire uh, and a few guard posts. But over time, it ends up being uh, turned into uh, a large, roughly 12 foot, uh, in some cases, I think it goes as high as 20, maybe in some other cases, concrete wall, a very thick, like three foot thick wall that goes all the way across um, East and West Berlin and separates the two. Okay, and there are armed guard towers that are eventually constructed, uh, and it's virtually impossible to get from one side of the city to the next after that without being shot and killed. Meanwhile, Kennedy and the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, who you see here, end up escalating the arms race with the Soviets because now there is a potential threat for nuclear war on the horizon. Okay. Uh, the U.S., for example, increases its nuclear stockpile by five times, okay. and again, this is still something that hasn't fully been depleted since. Okay, There has been a gradual decrease of armaments since the end of the Cold War, um, but not all of these missiles and not all of these bombs are completely gone. Uh, 300,000 men are also added to the armed forces. And the U.S. Special Forces are created in the meantime. These are the Green Berets, the men who actually uh, begin to take on a lot more responsibility, especially when Vietnam escalates. Uh, these are men who are uh, hand-selected by the U.S. government to engage in guerrilla warfare, and they're supposed to act as a, quote, more flexible response than nuclear weapons. Okay, So uh, special forces are sent in in uh, basically what is called a black operation, right? a black ops initiative. Uh, the men are sent in typically uh, under cover of darkness in some cases in a some sort of a secret mission to either assassinate or uh, surgically extract individuals from a certain area, right, to try to put something down uh, as strategically and as quietly as possible um, to basically act as a way of an alternate to a nuclear bomb, okay? In other words, a nuclear bomb would have way too much fallout, not only in the literal sense, but also in the human element. We don't want that kind of collateral damage, and so this is a potential alternative for that. In October of 1962, we enter into a period of time where the U.S. and the Soviet Union come as close as they ever do to a nuclear exchange, and it's a very, very frightening period here. Uh, October 16th, Kennedy learns that the Soviets have begun sending nuclear missiles to Cuba. Okay. Uh, and again, this could potentially be viewed as an act of war. All right, this is a very, very serious problem because the Soviets have already learned uh, that the U.S. has begun to send uh, nuclear missiles to Turkey on the Soviet border, and so the Soviets have turned around and done the exact same thing to the U.S. Okay, we have nuclear missiles uh, stationed within a few hundred miles of one another, okay, waiting for each other to push the button. So there are so 40 Soviet missile sites, 25 jet bombers that are being fueled in Cuba at this point. Uh, and Kennedy and the National Security Council have two different scenarios in mind for what could potentially happen here. Either A, we end up uh, sending a surgical airstrike on the missiles, okay, followed by a ground invasion if necessary, okay, and B, 
we put forth a naval blockade on Cuba. Okay, this would actually cause U.S. warships uh, to begin stopping and searching Soviet vessels that are showing up to make sure that there are no missiles or no nuclear uh, components on board. Okay, so we have an aggressive way of doing things or a defensive way of doing things. And Kennedy actually does something that is rather remarkable in hindsight, especially considering the really secretive and um, you know divisive way that the the Cold War actually comes across at this time. Uh, on October 27th, 22nd, he goes on national TV and tells the nation exactly what is happening. Okay, uh, And something like this, is, since then, the U.S. government has tended to keep this kind of thing under wraps. But he tells the nation that uh, we are going to send a naval blockade to Cuba and that Cuba actually has nuclear weapons at its, at its disposal at this point. Right, uh, Basically saying that uh, the worst uh, could potentially happen within the next few days. And that the armed forces are prepared for any eventuality. Okay, we may very well enter into a third world war, into a nuclear war of some kind. Uh, and this is really when uh, we start to see these air raids, our air raid sirens and drills and so forth, really beginning to escalate in the United States. People are really beginning to get concerned that this is a reality. And the Soviets are told by uh, by Kennedy and by his administration to move the world back from the abyss of destruction. Right, this is a very real uh, concern all over the world. That if uh, if the two countries do ex enter into a nuclear exchange, it could destroy all life on the planet. And Nikita Khrushchev, instead of actually stepping back, steps forward and responds by sending Soviet ships to uh, to the area and saying, "You have to ignore U.S. warships and continue." October 24th is the, the, the decisive day in the midst of all this. Uh, five Soviet ships stop just short of the quarantine line. Okay, There is a, a quarantine line that exists in the waters around Cuba, and if the ships had gone over that line, it would be construed as an act of war, and the U.S. and the Soviet Union would have entered into a hot war. There could very easily have been a nuclear exchange as a direct result. Um, the uh, at the very last minute, allegedly there is a Soviet uh, officer who actually ignores it and stops instead. Okay? Ignores his boss's orders, uh, and this is uh, if you ever uh, in in pop culture terms, this is actually uh, dramatized and obviously stylized and turned into something completely different in the film X Men First Class. If you ever watch this, the um, the insinuation here is that the X Men intervene somehow, but but it's a it's a dramatized version of what actually does happen. Okay, so it, it is based on actual events. Uh, two days later, Khrushchev actually comes out and offers the U.S. a deal, right? Since the U.S. Uh, has kind of called his bluff here, uh, and Kennedy actually ends up accepting Khrushchev's uh, deal here, ending up leading to uh, Kennedy's entire cabinet in complete outrage over what he does. Um, the Soviets say that they agree to remove all missiles from Cuba in exchange for the public promise of the United States that the U.S. never try to invade Cuba. Okay. And the other thing that acts as much more of a deterrent for uh, and the advantage of the Soviets is that the Soviets actually tell Kennedy that they know there are nuclear missiles in Turkey. Okay. Uh, and if they if they know this, then what else do they know? Okay, so this is basically saying we know that you have missiles aimed at us. We have missiles aimed at you. Let's both back down at the same time. Whoever blinks first is the one who's going to lose here. So tensions very quickly end up subsiding after that. Uh, but this period is a very, very tense uh, 10 days that occur in October of 1962. And they're known as the Cuban Missile Crisis for very obvious reasons. Okay. Uh, the U.S. then turns around and has a complete change of tone when it comes to the Soviets. Uh, we agreed to sell surplus American wheat to the Soviets, who are still in the midst of the recovery from the Stalin era famine. Uh, and there is an installation of a hotline directly from Washington to Moscow to have direct communication between the U.S. and the Soviet premier. Okay. Uh, all U.S. missiles are removed from Turkey, Italy, and Great Britain. And in September of 1963, there is a test ban treaty that's ratified, basically saying that uh, both countries agree to ban all testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, okay? Because increased testing of this could potentially irradiate the atmosphere and cause nuclear fallout anyway, okay? So it's, it's kind of remarkable that both countries end up uh, backing down as quickly and as dramatically as they do, considering just how close we got here.
Um, but this is a, a step in the right direction in the long run, uh, this test ban treaty, because it ends up being the first joint agreement during the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and it's the first step uh, toward some kind of improved relations between the two countries. It okay. doesn't last very long, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. Meanwhile, in South Vietnam, uh, things are beginning to worsen more and more under uh, the autocratic rulership of Ngo Dinh Diem. Okay? Um, you see here in the background this image of a Buddhist monk uh, who has self-immolated. This is something that was actually broadcast on national television in the 1960s in real time as it was occurring. Um, and it's a, it's a difficult image to view, so I apologize for those of you with weak constitutions, but this is uh, a Buddhist monk who has doused himself in gasoline and set himself on fire. Uh, this was a, a protest against uh, the, the Viet Cong and specifically against Ngo Dinh Diem's autocratic rulership. Uh, the, the Buddhists in South Vietnam were being uh, persecuted uh, by, by his particular rulership. And uh, this particular instance, it, you can view the full video of it if you wish, but it's, it's difficult to watch. This man sits there and burns to death without moving a muscle throughout the entire thing. It's, it's remarkable and horrific to watch at the same time. Um, Diem actually fails to fulfill any of the promises that he's made when it comes to social and economic reforms. Uh, he has proven that he cannot and will not be controlled by the United States. Um, meanwhile, he starts to use all these tactics to repress communists and the Buddhists themselves, as you see here. This is a, a protest against him. Uh, and meanwhile, Kennedy ends up sending 16,000 what he refers to as military advisors to South Vietnam to try to basically uh, bring Diem to heel, right? Basically trying to put him on a leash and make sure that he uh, complies with what the U.S. wants. He calls them advisors, but in reality, they're soldiers. Okay? He's doing this as a way to try to, again, tighten the noose a little bit. Meanwhile, the Communist National Liberation Front, or the NLF, launches a very violent insurgency uh, against the South Vietnamese government and Diem, and they end up recruiting the Viet Cong against the government as well. Okay, so we have the NLF and the Viet Cong now fighting against Diem, the, uh, the U.S.-sponsored leader in South Vietnam. Um, American military, these advisors, quote-unquote, began to relocate um, Vietnamese peasants in South Vietnam to what they call strategic hamlets. In other words, they take them out of the major cities and try to locate them to places where they can keep an eye on them. Okay? And the biggest problem in Vietnam when it comes to knowing who the enemy is, and this is something that becomes one of the biggest features of the Vietnam War, uh, is that the Viet Cong hide in plain sight. They dress as peasants, they have no uniforms, and they can disappear into the background very quickly and very easily. Okay, So relocating Vietnamese peasants uh, is the equivalent of basically relocating people who could potentially be the enemy. Okay, so these strategic hamlets are, I won't necessarily call them concentration camps because they're not necessarily that well organized, but it's a way for the government to be able to keep an eye on them, to make sure that they are not the enemy. Uh, and Diem himself is ultimately deemed a liability by the U.S. and by the NLF and the Viet Cong who are fighting against him. Okay. Um, in November of 1963, the Vietnamese generals who are actually working under Diem launch a coup with the approval of the U.S., and they take control of Saigon. Okay? Saigon is the, the capital of South Vietnam at this point. And Diem and his son are uh, suddenly murdered by the, the generals themselves, the men who launched this coup. Uh, and the generals uh, end up fighting each other for control all of a sudden. So this coup ends up turning into not only an armed insurgency, but uh, an all-out bloodbath, okay? Everybody is killing each other, and Diem and his son are two individuals who are targeted and murdered in the, in the aftermath of this. So now South Vietnam is even more unstable than it was before, okay? Now we don't have an autocratic ruler, now it's under martial law, okay? And all of the financial support that the U.S. has been sending to South Vietnam is suddenly being sent to corrupt politicians in the area. So it's funding, you know, different uh, drug rings, it's funding prostitution, it's funding all kinds of criminal activity instead, lining the pockets of corrupt politicians instead. And Kennedy ultimately says that he wants South Vietnam 
uh, to remain under U.S. control, okay, and for the U.S. to actually retain a presence there, um, citing domino theory, saying that if we if we don't have a presence at all, the alternative is that it falls to communism, which he believes is worse than what is actually going on at that time. Now, of course, the very infamous day that we're all familiar with, especially here in North Texas, um, on November 27th, 22nd of 1963, um, John F. Kennedy is assassinated, uh, allegedly here, by a former uh, former Marine that has turned communist in the form of Lee Harvey Oswald, okay, here in Dallas. Um, and of course, if you are a resident of North Texas, you can still go uh, to the, the assassination location, to the book depository, where you can see uh, allegedly where Oswald was positioned with a rifle up in the, one of the top floors. Uh, there is still an X painted on the street where Kennedy was shot, where the motorcade was passing through. Uh, and you can go to the exact place on the, the quote unquote grassy knoll and, and see exactly where everything occurred. Um, the the whole instance with Lee Harvey Oswald potentially being uh, the assassin here, uh, in a lot of people's minds, Oswald was either considered a patsy who really didn't commit the crime or that someone else paid him to do it. Okay, There are, of course, tons of conspiracy theories concerning this, and it's potentially the largest conspiracy-driven uh, event that occurs in American history, at least in the 20th century. Um, Oswald was allegedly a very big admirer of Fidel Castro. He allegedly lived in the Soviet Union for a while uh, and was supposedly uh, a communist uh, dissenter in the United States. He became a communist and had hatred for the government. Okay. Um, he actually did flee the scene of the crime uh, and was actually caught in the Texas theater in Dallas where you can actually still go today. You can go into the room where he was caught. Uh, he shoots and kills a police officer, does do that with a revolver on the street uh, before he is caught. So, um, you know, despite whether he actually did pull the trigger that killed Kennedy or not, uh, there is a, a very famous film that exists out there on YouTube. And I'll, if you're in uh, one of my classes, I will upload it to the discussion board. But it's called the Zapruder film. Uh, and it's a, the, the most famous film of the of the assassination, showing Kennedy being shot and killed in real time. Uh, some people have posited that there are two different assassins, uh, that one bullet actually came from uh, the book depository and another came from the grassy knoll, of course, there on the street. Uh, there have also been insinuations that one of his own uh, secret servicemen turned around and shot Kennedy in the face. Uh, and that there is somehow a missing frame somewhere in the film. So there's all kinds of different theories. Take from it what you will. Uh, but there are, of course, several studies that you can get into on whether or not one thing or another has occurred. Um, again, this is something that has been endlessly, uh, you know, dramatized and so forth. The film JFK, of course, delves into this very deeply. There's tons of documentaries out there. Uh, the, the Kennedy Museum in Dallas, of course, has its own uh, theories as to what happened. Um, to make matters worse, though, uh, two days after this occurs, um, all uh, definitive evidence and definitive uh, closure of what could have happened, what actually did happen to Kennedy, is put to rest because uh, a nightclub owner in Dallas named Jack Ruby very famously walks up and shoots and kills Lee Harvey Oswald while he's on his way to a court hearing. Okay. Uh, and the image that you see here at the bottom is the assassination of Oswald happening in real time. Okay, you see the image here of Jack Ruby on the bottom right, pulling the trigger, the gunshot, and Oswald reacting as the bullet hits him in the chest. Okay. Uh, and this particular photograph won a, uh, a Pulitzer Prize uh, for, for being something that, again, is so incredibly divisive, right? It, it puts to rest any closure that could potentially have been unearthed here. Okay. So H Oswald uh, ends up dying not too long thereafter, uh, and Jack Ruby lives until 1967. So any hope of resolution concerning uh, testimony by Oswald, whether or not he could have provided the truth of what happened or not, is uh, is something that the, the country will truly never really uh, recover from. Now, as it relates to the Civil Rights Movement, this is one of the, of course, the biggest events that occurs during the 1960s. It's something that's already been going on uh, since the 1950s. 
and so for it to continue on during this period really leads to the zenith of the civil rights movement. Uh, and of course, the further we get into the 60s, and when we finally reach the end, we enter into uh, a very climactic uh, event or two that end up occurring. So we'll get into some of the more um, specific details of it here. Once Martin Luther King Jr. takes control of the, the stage, anyway, of the civil rights movement during the 1950s, and especially during the Eisenhower era, uh, he comes to the forefront more and more, especially as we get into the 1960s. He is now considered the face of the civil rights movement because he is the one leading most of the protests. Uh, and of course, this idea of civil disobedience is something that is uh, extremely popular and gains a lot of press, okay, because he's not actually fighting back and his supporters are not fighting back either. Um, he also understands the idea of political power, of social change. He's actually a very well-read individual. He read Marx, he read, um, you know, communist literature, he read, uh, you know, all these different uh, political strategies and how politics ends up shifting over time. So he understands the balance of power and everything, but he's not really looking to enact any kind of violence in the meantime. Uh, and the image that you see here at the bottom right is something also that can be found on the internet. It's something I believe that actually does exist in the Library of Congress at this point. Um, if you are a member of one of my classes, again, I'll upload this to this discussion board as well. But um, Martin Luther King Jr. is actually targeted by the FBI at one point uh, for the different activities that he engages in. Uh, and the telegram that you see here, it's difficult to, to see, uh, basically is a, 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 a campaign to try to get him to commit suicide. And they go into depth about how he is being watched, about how uh, they know about all the allegedly illicit activities that he was involved in. Um, and, and, you know, when it comes to uh, not subjective, but uh, objective fact here, Martin Luther King Jr. was involved in some extramarital affairs. Uh, he did have a love for drink. He had a love for women who were younger than his wife. Um, and uh, the, the FBI kept tabs on all that, kept a running tally of different things, and were uh, trying to find a way to basically blackmail him and okay? say that if you, you can either die with some measure of dignity by killing yourself, or we will tell the public about what all has been going on here. Okay, so some of this has been leaked uh, after the fact. Whether it is all true or not remains to be seen. Okay, uh, whether evidence actually backs any of it up or not. Again, I'm I'm not weighing in on any of that here. Okay, take from this what you will as well. I'm not trying to, you know, smear a, a beloved public figure here, but uh, objectively speaking, uh, he does not have a spotless record. Is basically what it amounts to. Um, over time, though, uh, the the uh, move toward non-aggression when it comes to uh, um, protest and so forth, begins to take on a new form, okay? In February of 1960, uh, four young black college students go to uh, the Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, which you see here in the background. They sit down at the lunch counter and they order coffee and donuts, okay? And this particular lunch counter is considered a segregated counter designated for whites only, okay? and after time, they sit there and sit there and sit there um, for um, for several hours, and they are um, eventually they end up getting up and leaving because no one serves them. Okay, uh, the next day they return for with 24 more students, and they sit down, and everything that you would see occurring in the background ends up happening then. Okay, all of the whites in the Woolworths uh, lunch area suddenly start pelting them with food and with drink. They start spitting at them, hitting them, throwing things at them, screaming, cursing at them, uh, abusing them in every uh, you know way that they possibly can. A and they all sit there and they take it. Okay, through this form of uh, of non-aggression, right? They are they're not willing to fight back. And eventually, over the course of the next two months, this form of protest, something called a sit-in, ends up uh, happening all over the country. Okay, 50,000 more students, both black and white in this case, end up banding, banding together and doing this in several different instances. Okay, white and black students will sit together at different lunch counters, different restaurants, uh, when it comes to uh, transportation and all over the place, and refuse to move. 
Okay, they they ask to be served, and they are pelted with garbage and food and everything else. And over time, approximately 3,600 people are arrested, uh, including a, a very famous comedian who you see up here named Dick Gregory. Uh, Dick Gregory uh, engaged in this during the time uh, was very political at the time, and eventually just became a, a comedian in the long term. Uh, he's very famously noted for saying at one point that uh, when he goes and sits down at one of these lunch counters, um, the man tells him, we don't serve Negroes here. And he says, well, that's convenient because I don't eat Negroes. Okay. So he actually uses humor to try to diffuse the situation. Um, of course, it doesn't really, he doesn't get the laughs that he's really looking for here. By July of 1960, Greensboro ends up lifting the, the whites only policy. Okay, so this uh, this particular form of protest is actually working. Okay, uh, putting pressure on individuals to actually stop these racist practices ends up uh, having results. Okay, and by April of 1960, okay, going back a couple of months, uh, 200 different student activists end up converging uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, to form what is called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Okay? They are the ones who organize these sit-ins and these these particular forms of protest. Okay, so this is actually beginning to take root in colleges and universities all over the country, and it's the younger generation that are actually getting involved in this. And the whole goal here is try to, to dismantle uh, the practice of segregation through nonviolent protest. Okay, it's exactly what Martin Luther King is looking for. And of course, the activists themselves who actually engage in this are physically attacked, and in some cases, uh, they uh, you know they draw so much attention and so much ire that they are actually killed in in a few instances as well. So um, just because they refuse to fight back does not mean that they are going to come out of this um, unscathed. By 1961, the civil rights leaders begin to look more closely at public transportation. Uh, and in this case, they end up gaining the support of John F. Kennedy. Okay, And Kennedy is playing a, a very uh, dangerous game by this point. Again, we're, we're going back in time a little bit here before this assassination. Uh, and some people have even pointed to this particular um, type of instance and Kennedy's uh, support of it as being something that was a factor in his assassination. Again, take from it what you will, though. Um, James Farmer actually ends up leading the Congress of Racial Equality here, okay, and he is the one who ends up organizing what are called freedom rides, okay. Uh, it's basically where uh, whites and blacks get, in, get together on buses, sit together, and uh, basically ride all over the country in protest of what's going on. Um, and in many cases, these buses are actually attacked. Uh, very famously, in one case in Alabama, uh, the bus is actually surrounded and firebombed by white supremacists. Okay, you can actually see the aftermath of that bus in the background here. Okay, uh, all of the supporters uh, or the uh, the activists themselves get off the bus before uh, before anyone is really majorly hurt or killed. Um, and when they do get off, they're met with uh, bats and clubs and two by fours. Okay? And the, the protesters are beaten very savagely. Um, on a second bus, a few of them are beaten by uh, people waiting for a second bus, right? In a whites only waiting room at a bus terminal. And in May 17th, uh, Diane Nash and 10 others end up taking a bus to Birmingham where they're all arrested. Okay? Uh, and Diane Nash, as you can tell here, uh, is a very light-skinned African-American woman. Okay? So uh, even individuals who can quote-unquote, again, pass for white, end up getting um, hit with the brunt of this. So it's not only black activists who are getting attacked, but some, in some cases, uh, people of mixed ethnicity and whites as well are being attacked. Anyone who is a supporter of this is openly being attacked. In the meantime, the police chief in Birmingham, a man named Eugene Connor, who goes by the nickname of Bull Connor, uh, takes uh, Diane Nash and the others into custody. Uh, he takes them to the outskirts of town and he leaves them at nighttime, basically says, don't ever come back. Kennedy, meanwhile, starts getting a lot of flack from Southern Democrats over this, uh, and he realizes it, that it is costing him politically. Okay? And he uh, is quoted at one point as saying behind closed doors that he views the Freedom Riders as a pain in the ass, okay? that it is something that is uh, actually um, losing support. He's losing support from his Southern contingency because of this. Um, and he also believes that it is something that um, 
grants more credibility to the Soviet Union, because remember the Soviets, even back during the Eisenhower administration, were trying to use the racist policies in the United States against them to say that this is a reason why capitalism doesn't work. Okay? So, and of course, he is getting ready to enter into a meeting with Khrushchev at this point uh, and views this as being something that is going to undermine his credibility. Uh, and he orders his special assistant on civil rights, a man named Harris Wolford, to actually shut them down and to stop this from happening again. Eventually, though, he actually caves in and provides another bus for the Freedom Riders to continue. So, again, whether this actually is something that he does uh, based on uh, you know, public pressure or if he actually does it out of uh, a guilty conscience or whatever uh, remains to be seen. I mean, there's really no way we can know Kennedy's mind on this. And the riders themselves are actually attacked in Montgomery, Alabama, not too long thereafter. Okay. Uh, Martin Luther King and others end up gathering at a church the following evening, and uh, a firebomb is thrown into the place. Okay. People end up getting out. Uh, I don't think anyone is seriously hurt here. I can't remember, though. Um, and the Freedom Riders are finally uh, protected by the Alabama National Guard. Okay. Um, and it's, uh, once they cross state lines into Mississippi, though, they end up getting arrested. Okay, so even the states themselves are not willing to provide direct um, uh, protection from one state to the next, right? In some cases, it ends up working against them. By September, the Interstate Commerce Commission ends up ordering that all interstate transportation and facilities be integrated. So this has actually worked. Again, all of the, the bad press that's been given to southern states and the federal government over this, about all the harsh treatment and everything that's been, uh, that's been occurring for the last several decades, ends up causing a public pressure campaign that changes the law. And within a year, Martin Luther King demonstrates nonviolence at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. While he's actually on stage giving a speech, um, uh, a white member of the American Nazi Party jumps up on the stage and punches him in the face. Okay? And uh, Martin Luther King, rather than fighting back, um, basically takes the punch, and uh, other members actually tackle uh, the, the aggressor and end up dragging him out of the place. Uh, ultimately, over time, though, King's, bomb, or King's home is actually bombed three different times. Uh, so it's he is constantly living uh, in a state of siege, of siege, right? He's he's not able to really get away from these aggressors, no matter where he goes, right? He has to kind of live in hiding. His family has to be kept safe. Uh, so it's a, it's a very very difficult uh, way to live in the midst of all this. In 1963. Um, the American public finally becomes widely uh, aware of what's going on in the South when it comes to the civil rights movement when Martin Luther King and a group of his supporters organize a series of demonstrations in Birmingham, Alabama. Okay. Um, and the reason why this becomes so um, popularized and why the American public finally begins to shift its perspective is because this is actually televised. Okay. Um, for the very first time, uh, the American public sees news programs actually going in with camera crews and videotaping the protests, right? Videotaping uh, local police coming in with fire hoses and guard dogs, beating people, attacking people, shooting them with these hoses, uh, as you can see here, as they actually are not fighting back. Okay, so it seems like, uh, and actually is in many cases, an instance where you see the the, the local law enforcement actually uh, beating people into submission, okay? fighting them, attacking them, uh, and the, the people themselves are not fighting back. And the governor of Alabama, George Wallace, uh, in the meantime, has vowed to keep segregation as an institution. He says that it's not something he's willing to give up. Um, and Wallace himself is openly white supremacist. He actually attempts at one point in 1964 to run for the presidency under a completely different uh, third party in politics that supports uh, white supremacy. Uh, and meanwhile, Martin Luther King is trying to expose all of this, this Southern racism to the rest of the nation, because uh, for a long time, it's been an out of sight, out of mind thing for the country. Um, people have either turned a blind eye to what is going on, or they have claimed that they are not aware of it. And, and a lot of people who grew up in the North during this particular time period were quoted as saying that they had no idea that this was actually happening. Okay? Uh, as young people, they, they were far enough removed from this type of physical violence to where they allegedly didn't know that it was happening. 
Whether that's true or not, again, take from it what you will. But during the course of this particular series of protests, uh, hundreds of people are arrested, uh, and more and more are actually beginning to participate. Okay? So this is actually gaining more support and traction than it is actually diminishing. Okay? Um, on May 7th, King leads 2,500 demonstrators through the streets. Uh, I believe a few slides before this is where you can actually see that picture. Um, and of course, Bull Connor, the man who is the, the local sheriff, ends up using the guard dogs, tear gas, uh, fire hoses, and even cattle prods on, on the protesters. So, um, and obviously, this, all of these things have an extremely lethal combination. Okay? Uh, if you use tear gas on people, obviously it's going to affect their ability to see and ability to breathe. They can suffocate and die from this if they're not careful. Um, guard dogs obviously can tear people to shreds. And if you soak someone with a fire hose and zap them with a cattle prod, you are effectively electrocuting them. So uh, it's uh, it's no surprise that several people are uh, dramatically injured in the process of this. And of course, this is televised all over the country. So now Kennedy is forced into actually doing something about this. And over 3,000 demonstrators end up being arrested in the long term, including King himself. Um, and this is where he writes his letter from Birmingham jail. This is the most famous uh, arguably the most famous of his written documents that he produces during the period, uh, basically where a group of local white evangelicals uh, basically write to him and tell him that they expect him to basically keep his place and all this and to and to stop doing it. Uh, and he writes them back and says no, effectively, that there there's too much at stake here, um, that this is not what we expect uh, needs to happen in a Christian nation and all this kind of stuff. Um, so it's it's extremely uh, uh, emotionally charged, and it's one of the most famous uh, documents that comes from the civil rights period. And the worst part about all this is even though violent racism occurs in the South, um, the ones that are considered to be the biggest liability to the civil rights movement, and even to this very day in the 21st century, are white moderates, uh, the ones who are more devoted to order, to keeping their head down and not making waves, uh, and basically saying that they you know, want things to continue on uh, in a status quo, are really the ones who are you know, not helping the matter, right? They're the ones who are acting as a bigger physical barrier than the people who are, uh, who are actually physically beating and murdering people. And the Birmingham officials in the city finally end up ending segregationist practices after all this occurs because of all the flack that it gets from the rest of the country. Um, in June, Wallace ends up actually blocking the door to the University of Alabama. He prevents several black students from registering, okay? Uh, and it takes the intervention of JFK again for this to actually stop. Uh, he makes a new televised speech in favor of a new civil rights bill, okay? And this is something that uh, Kennedy actually does not see actually come to fruition in his lifetime. It doesn't actually occur, uh, get approval until 1964. Uh, and I think it doesn't actually go into full effect until 65 when Lyndon Johnson is president. After Kennedy makes this televised speech, um, a 37 year old activist named Medgar Evers is actually shot and killed by a white supremacist in his driveway that evening. Okay. Uh, and Kennedy views this as being um, something that is his fault. He thinks that somehow this is uh, he has incited um, uh, the, the the pushback of white supremacists by saying these types of things. Okay? Uh, and he ends up holding the first meeting of civil rights leaders in the White House as a direct result, basically saying, "How can I help?" Um, and not too long thereafter is when there is a massive demonstration at the mall in Washington uh, that is planned. Meanwhile, the Southern Democrats are just up in arms over Kennedy's uh, support of the civil rights movement. Uh, they do everything they can to block the civil rights bill from passing, uh, still trying to insinuate that the South belongs to, uh, to whites only and that, uh, that this is something that they don't want to see uh, come to fruition. On August 28th of 1963, the March on Washington occurs. Okay, 250,000 uh, Americans, both black and white, march on Washington, and this is one of the the biggest, if not the most famous, uh, event of the civil rights era. 
uh, and it's considered the largest political demonstration in American history. Uh, I think it's only been recently outpaced um, by, uh, I think might have been just slightly outpaced by the Women's March uh, on Washington in, tw in uh, 2017, I think is when it happened. Um, but the March on Washington ends up being a six hour long protest. There are speeches, musical performances. Uh, there, this is a, this is a, a multimedia, uh, protest that occurs. Okay. Um, and this, of course, is where Martin Luther King delivers his I have a dream speech. Okay. Uh, and it's a very, very profound moment because it's, um, it's him drawing on a, a sermon that he gave many times before. Uh, which calls upon the imagery, of course, of, uh, of Jews escaping Egypt from the book of Exodus and the Old Testament, uh, of Moses leading the way to the promised land and so forth. So it's a, uh, it's a very familiar speech, uh, especially to the African American community in which this particular, um, imagery has been used for several decades, even leading up to and after the Emancipation Proclamation occurred. So, uh, it's, it's got a lot of, a uh, lot of history behind it. Uh, and of course, there's tons of religious imagery that's being used here, primarily because MLK himself, remember, is a Baptist preacher. Okay, so this is not, uh, it's nothing out of the ordinary for him. And of course, the moment saying, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. This is the, the crowning moment of this speech. On September 15th, um, four Klansmen in Birmingham end up detonating a bomb in a black church and they end up killing four young girls in response to this. Okay, so the the Klan unfortunately is uh, continuing its reign of terror in the South, and the bombing of the Black Church is one of the biggest um, blows to this particular movement in the South, and especially in Birmingham, where so much was actually done in recent times. And so now there's a brand new wave of national indignation against racism. Okay, people in the North are finally beginning to change their tone. There's been a large indifference to it. Uh, in some cases, open support of it, but that is slowly starting to change a little bit. Um, and the Warren Court is another entity that's partially responsible uh, for helping legislation get passed during this time to actually put this into a legal status, okay, to get rid of it. 1962, school prayer is deemed unconstitutional, and it's something that violates the separation of church and state. So this ends up dismantling a bit of what happens uh, during the Eisenhower administration, okay? Um, something where, you know, the government could be potentially exercising a loophole to keep Christianity at the forefront. Uh, again, technically and um, objectively, this is something that does violate the separation of church and state, okay? Uh, but again, it still has controversy even today. So again, take from it what you will. Um, 1963, the court case Gideon v. Wainwright says that every felony defendant has the right to be given legal representation despite their ability to pay. So if they can't afford an attorney, uh, one will be provided to them. 1964, the court case of Escobedo versus Illinois says that all individuals who are accused of crimes have to be allowed to consult an attorney or any, an attorney before police interrogation. And the most famous of these, of course, is the Miranda v. Arizona case, right? This is what says uh, all individuals accused of a crime have to be informed of their rights. Okay, so you've heard uh, Miranda rights being given to people if you've ever uh, watched any kind of, um, you know, uh, police uh, procedural show, Law and Order, or something like that. Uh, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can or will be used against you in the court of law. You also have the right of an attorney. If you, uh, if you can't afford one, one will be pro provided to you. Right? That's the basic Miranda rights. Okay. From 1963 to 1964, uh, again, the South is still involved in so many racist practices that is uh, that still count as major barriers to the civil rights movement. Um, blacks are still being subjected to poll taxes. If they're not able to pay to vote, then they are not allowed to vote. Okay. There are still very difficult literacy tests. There's physical intimidation. Uh, so there's all kinds of deeply entrenched uh, racist policies that exist in the South that are preventing people from getting ahead in life. Um, Robert Moses, nicknamed Bob Moses here, 
who is the head of the uh, the SNCC, right? This group that actually organized sit-ins uh, begins recruiting uh, volunteers, both black and white, to try to organize what he calls freedom schools in rural African American communities in the South. And the whole point of this is to actually be able to educate uh, black communities into uh, ways to get to be able to vote, right? To be able to pass literacy tests. Uh, to be able to uh, gain an education, get better jobs, be able to pay the poll taxes, ways at least to combat these laws while they're still in place somehow. Okay? And most of the volunteers that he ends up recruiting are idealistic white college students. Okay? So individuals who are able through some form of white privilege to gain control of an education and then be able to turn around and use it for something good. Okay? So Mississippi state leaders start stockpiling tear gas, cattle prods, and even shotguns in some cases to push back against this. Okay, there are certain areas of the South where the actual powers that be are so deeply entrenched in racism that they are willing to um, result to murder, resort to murder to, to prevent this from happening. In mid-June, all the volunteers meet at a college in Ohio to basically get some kind of a uh, – a uh, crash course in what is going to happen here, okay? Uh, they're told about the racial history of the South, uh, the practice of civil disobedience, and they're given a warning basically about what could potentially happen to them, that they are very likely going to be abused, that some of them could very potentially be killed. Uh, and unsurprisingly, many of them end up departing from the group altogether before they actually leave for the South, okay? This is uh, a, a clear and present danger to the people involved. Over time, though, there are 41 freedom schools that are actually um, constructed in the South or that are actually put into um, operation. Okay? So there are thousands of people who are taught uh, math, writing, history, uh, all kinds of things where education is actually finally disseminated in areas where it's been suppressed. Uh, the adults are taught voter registration processes. And individuals like Fannie Lou Hamer uh, succeed as uh, in getting involved in all this as well. Okay, She is a lay preacher. She's one of the biggest influential black leaders. Um, and Congress ends up approving the Civil Rights Act in 1964. And this is what uh, ultimately becomes the, the milestone uh, civil rights law of the 1960s and of the 20th century. Okay, uh, It outlaws discrimination based on race, color, sex, religion, or nation of origin. Okay, uh, and it's something that's embedded in uh, virtually every single job application that you find today, uh, any kind of loan application for anything you see today. Uh, all of this harkens back to this particular law. Um, in June of not, uh, June twenty uh, first, two days later, um, three particular individuals are reported missing. Right, three of the NS or the SNCC workers. James Earl Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner. Um, all three of them uh, go to investigate a black church that has been burned, and they go missing. Uh, two months later, all three of their bodies are discovered buried in a dam at a cattle pond, uh, and it's discovered that this is a, uh, a burial ground for KKK murders, that this is basically – there are multiple other bodies that are discovered buried in the swamp in this particular area. Uh, and in total, eight murdered individuals are discovered in the area, right, in the rivers and swamps, buried in this dam. Meanwhile, uh, Martin Luther King's movement towards civil disobedience is not gaining universal support. Okay? Uh, there is a parallel movement that occurs during the same time in the form of the Black Power Movement. Okay. From the 1960s, uh, we've already started to discuss this particular uh, phenomenon where um, white uh, middle class individuals are leaving urban areas and are going into suburban areas. Okay. And all of the um, individuals who are left behind in inner cities, 70 percent of them, 70 uh, percent of blacks in America in particular, are living in these urban areas that are slowly being neglected by the federal government and by local and state governments as well. Okay, So uh, housing projects are starting to fall into disrepair. There's crime. There's disease. There's all kinds of problems that are occurring in inner cities, uh, and they become kind of the, uh, the centers for hatred. In 1965, uh, there is a, uh, a large uh, – 
black neighborhood in Los Angeles known as Watts that ends up uh, erupting into a series of riots that occur over the next several days. Um, and in the aftermath, 34 people are killed, 4,000 people are jailed, uh, and there's massive property damage. Several buildings are burned, windows are smashed, uh, cars are set on fire, all kinds of things end up occurring. Uh, and this is basically in protest, violent protest, that is, against uh, the racism that occurs in the South and also the institutionalized racism that is still going on in the rest of the country. And between 1965 and 1968, there are nearly 300 different uh, uprisings that occur over racial tensions in the United States. And the movement of black power is something that is uh, the violent strain of, uh, of what occurs uh, when it comes to um, racial protests. Okay? So while, whereas Martin Luther King has nonviolence as his uh, primary avenue of doing this, uh, black power becomes the, um, the alternative. Okay? Uh, and the individual who tends to lead the charge in this is Malcolm X. Okay? Malcolm X is actually born uh, as uh, Malcolm Little okay, in Detroit, uh, and he's known by the age of 19 as Detroit Red. Okay? He becomes a, a pimp, a drug dealer, uh, and is actually imprisoned over time, and ends up, while in prison, joining what is called the Nation of Islam. Okay? And the Nation of Islam has had a long, uh, very entrenched uh, history, especially at this point in time, as being uh, an extremely violent and extremely racist organization with uh, a very cult-like atmosphere attached to it. Okay? Uh, and the Nation of Islam in particular is uh, an extremist form of Islam that primarily recruits uh, black members. Okay? And it pairs the civil rights movement with Islam with violent teachings going in both sides. Okay. Uh, and the leader of this group, at this particular point in time anyway, uh, is uh, the very uh, charismatic figure Elijah Muhammad. Okay. And if you ever watch um, Spike Lee's uh, dramatic uh, uh, film, Malcolm X, which is really, really um, an excellent film, by the way. It's uh, one of the best, uh, and if not the only real uh, definitive film about Malcolm X and his life, um, Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam are given a very um, transparent uh, uh, dramatization here. Okay? Uh, you kind of see exactly how they end up responding uh, to everything in the country and eventually to Malcolm X himself. Okay? Um, under the leadership of Elijah Muhammad, the Nation of Islam says that all whites are dismissed as devils. Uh, black nationalism is something that is very heavily uh, pushed to the forefront. A sense of racial pride and self-respect and self-discipline are all something that kind of come in, in this little package. Um, and Nation of Islam is very famous for uh, gaining members uh, who are incarcerated in the United States. Uh, they have kind of a, a reputation for being able to get young men off of drugs, to get them away from a life of crime. But the problem is, is they end up getting essentially brainwashed into joining this organization. Um, and in, in its modern form anyway, it's also extremely anti-Semitic. Um, uh, the, the current leader of it is Louis Farrakhan. Okay, Louis Farrakhan is, uh, has been noted as saying multiple times before, have, giving all kinds of hate speeches against Jews in particular, uh, and, uh, and, and so forth. So and again, Nation of Islam has kind of its own very uh, uh, heavily charged history, let's put it that way. In 1953, Malcolm X starts calling himself Malcolm X, saying that uh, he wants to lose the surname of Little because he believes that it is his slave name. Okay? Uh, he says he doesn't know his original African name, so he replaces his surname with the, with the letter X, okay? just basically to act as a, a placekeeper for his lost African name. Um, over time, as Malcolm X uh, gains in popularity before uh, he's actually assassinated, uh, he actually goes uh, on a, a pilgrimage, as many Muslims do, to Saudi Arabia, to Mecca, uh, to, uh, you know, on the, the Hajj, as it's known, right, this holy pilgrimage. Uh, and he ends up becoming a little bit softer in terms of some of his um, rhetoric when it comes to, uh, you know, not allowing whites into his particular protest movement and so forth. Uh, becomes a little bit more relaxed on that. Uh, and he also is very uh, famously um, scrutinized for his comments after Kennedy is assassinated. Um, he's quoted as saying 
uh, paraphrased anyway here, uh, paraphrasing, he said that basically the chickens have come home to roost. He says that basically Kenny, Kennedy was asking for it. Okay. So not all Americans are really on board with what Malcolm X is doing. Um, and even the nation of Islam begins to turn against him over time. Okay. So by February of 1965, um, Elijah Muhammad is actually so worried about uh, Malcolm X's popularity that he thinks that he could potentially be supplanted by Malcolm X. Um, Elijah Muhammad loses a lot of support over time as a direct result of him. Uh, and so the Nation of Islam actually sends a couple of assassins who uh, shoot Malcolm X in the chest with a shotgun during a speech in Manhattan, and he dies not too long thereafter. Uh, 1966, Stokely Carmichael becomes the head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, and this actually ends up turning into a, a, a very violent entity over time. Okay, uh, Carmichael ends up ousting all whites from the organization and begins arming black members uh, with uh, with guns. Okay, here's Stokely, uh, and he also eventually joins the Oakland-based Black Panther Party, which is established in in 1966. Okay, um, and Several students of mine have asked and have wondered uh, which came first, the Black Panther Party or the Marvel Comics superhero. Um, the Black Panther Party was established uh, only a few months, I believe, one or two months, I believe, after the, the Marvel Comics character. So technically, the character came first. Um, 1967, H. Rap Brown ends up replacing Stokely Carmichael uh, and becomes even more militant, says that blacks need to get guns and openly says they need to, quote, kill honkies. Okay. Honkies, of course, if you're not familiar with this, is uh, basically a white racial slur, if such a thing can exist. Okay. So um, it's a, you know, a, you know, a derogatory term for whites. Um, and from this point on, uh, he starts to gain more and more national attention away from the South and starts getting people to focus more on inner city ghettos in the North and in the West, saying that uh, this type of institutionalized racism is not just isolated to the South. That this is a problem all over the country. And it's something that deserves the American people's uh, attention and support, right, that it's um, to, to get rid of it. In 1967, Martin Luther King launches what he calls his Poor People's Campaign to try to branch out and support inner cities a bit more. Um, and from this point forward, there is a greater push for uh, programs concerning black studies with uh, Pan-Africanism, African cultural studies, artistic traditions, uh, and a lot more pro-black legislation is actually put through in Congress as a direct result. So. Um, from this point going into the 1970s, especially, you start to see more um, black studies programs erupting in colleges, a lot more black studies uh, courses and uh, artistic movements and so forth. So it's it's a second, um, all, I, I hesitate to, to say a second really, but almost like a second Harlem Renaissance in that regard, but it's a pan-African Renaissance, if you like. Meanwhile, after Kennedy's assassination, Lyndon Baines Johnson becomes president of the United States. And the photograph that you see here in the background is another very famous one. Um, this is actually taken uh, only hours after Kennedy was assassinated, okay, on board Air Force One as Lyndon Johnson is being sworn into the presidency. And of course, as you see here at his left shoulder is Jacqueline Kennedy, okay, Kennedy's wife. Um, and this photograph is actually cropped out here and is actually not colorized, but um, the full uh, photograph of this, if you can ever find it, and if you can ever see it colorized or at least um, tinted in a certain way, she has not changed clothing since her husband was killed. And if you ever watch the Zapruder film, you will see that when Kennedy is assassinated, he is shot in the head and he falls directly over into her lap. Okay. So while she is standing next to Johnson as he's being sworn in, she is still covered in her husband's blood. Okay, This is a, a very dramatic image that was not really widely uh, shown to the American people. But she is still in a, a state of shock, as you can almost tell by her facial expression. Okay. So less than 90 minutes after Kennedy is killed, she is on board Air Force One with Johnson as he is being sworn in. Uh, and Johnson is the very first Southern president that we've had since Woodrow Wilson was in office. Okay? Most of the other presidents uh, have been uh, from either the Midwest or from the North. And of course, we know that he was a Senate majority leader before being vice president. He's the one that began to push a lot of civil rights legislation in 
through uh, through Congress. And he's an extremely contradictory figure, a very strange and complex one. Okay, uh, He's known for giving what is called the Johnson treatment to people. And as you can see here, he loved to invade their personal space and intimidate them with his imposing figure. Uh, Johnson was somewhere around six foot three or six foot four and just had a very uh, imposing physical presence. Okay, He liked to lean in to intimidate people, to threaten them in some cases, um, and in some cases did it in a half-joking manner. Okay? Um, he's also known for being an individual who, even though he's extremely forceful, was very, very sensitive about criticism. Okay? He believed that all criticism was personal against him. Um, parenthetically, one of the things that he was known for doing is on his ranch in Texas, he actually had a, a car that was considered to be an amphibious car, uh, one that could operate both on land and in water as a boat. And as a practical joke, he used to invite people out to his ranch and drive the car into the lake, claiming that he was losing control, only for it to turn into a boat and, and continue across the water. When he goes into the presidency, though, Congress itself is still deadlocked. Remember, the, the country doesn't have a clear... Um, uh, majority when it comes to uh, conservatives or liberals at this point. Uh, and a lot of the decision-making process uh, ends up being uh, kicking him out of it, uh, mainly by the brothers of John F. Kennedy, uh, Robert Kennedy and Ted Kennedy, who are both members of Congress at this point. And uh, in the midst of all this, Johnson is very, very overconfident. He's very full of himself, uh, believes that he is going to be the greatest American president and, quote, the best friend the Negro ever had. Okay. Um, despite any and all legislation concerning civil rights acts and so forth that Johnson puts forward uh, behind closed doors, he makes no bones about what he really thinks about African Americans, uh, referring to the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Act as, quote, the N-word bill. <laughs> okay. Take from that what you will. On the subject of the Civil Rights Act itself, um, the, all the measures that Kennedy attempted to put through Congress uh, while he was still in office uh, end up being pushed through once Johnson is put in. Okay? So tax reduction and Civil Rights Acts are all being pushed through, um, can, specifically the Revenue Act in 1964. This causes a 20% reduction in taxes. Uh, this is supposed to create economic uh, stability, to create an economic boost and to create new jobs in the country. Um, and it works to a certain extent. Okay? From 64 to 66, uh, the country has an unemployment rate that falls to 3.8% uh, from 5.2%. Okay? And in July of 1964, the Civil Rights Act becomes law. Again, supposed to guarantee equal treatment under the law for all Americans, uh, prohibits any kind of discrimination when it comes to housing transactions, hiring and firing of employees, uh, when it comes to securing loans of any kind. So it's supposed to, by legal terms, keep everybody equally protected under the law. Um, and again, this is pretty groundbreaking because this is the first time that the federal government uh, has enforced something that is a systematic disavowal of racial segregation and has given this kind of power to the federal government in a way that uh, hasn't been able to be used before. Okay, remember, this was attempted back roughly 100 years before, after the Civil War ended, but um, only until the 20th century is this actually able to be um, put through and actually enforced. And it creates the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. Okay, so if you uh, ever apply for a job, chances are um, that employer is a member of the Equal Employment Commission. And the Civil Rights Act is presented uh, by Lyndon Johnson as a way to honor the memory of John F. Kennedy, right? Uh, he basically tries to say that this was Kennedy's brainchild. Uh, in many ways, it was, uh, it was Johnson's brainchild, but uh, in a way to actually gain him political brownie points more than anything else, okay? not really by any altruistic means. And uh, the, gen the senator from Georgia, Richard Russell, says that um, – that this is a horrible thing. He says that Lyndon Johnson is going to lose the vote of Southerners in 1964 if he tries to push this act through Congress. Um, basically, again, we, we're, we're coming up on another election year here uh, where Johnson could potentially um, gain or lose support of Southern Democrats depending on whether or not he does this. Okay, So he's already getting warnings from his own contingency about this.
And at the same time, too, Johnson tries to expand uh, the influence of the United States government into um, impoverished areas in the South and especially in the uh, the Appalachian regions of the country. Okay, uh, he says he's going to declare war on poverty. Okay. Uh, in 1962, an author named Michael Harrington publishes a book called The Other America, which states that about 40 million Americans are still living in poverty. Okay, uh, This book was actually pretty influential on Kennedy, who read it in 1963 and uh, was assassinated before he could really put through any kind of legislation to combat poverty. Um, and Harrington is the first one, one of the first ones anyway, to say that poverty is uh, kind of the root of all social problems, Okay, poor health. Uh, poor attendance at work and school, drug and alcohol abuse, crime, unwanted pregnancies, you name it. Okay, so he's saying that this the social gap and this um, the wage gap that it, that occurs in the United States is really the main problem in the midst of all this. And many um, sociologists and psychologists still say the same thing today. So the the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964 is passed next. This creates the Office of Economic Opportunity. Okay. And there are 11 community-based programs that come through this. There's a Job Corps training program, the Head Start educational program, which sponsors um, young children as they are entering into schooling for the first time, a legal services corporation to provide legal counsel, financial aid programs for students who are going to college, grants to small farmers and rural, rural businesses, excuse me, uh, loans to businesses that are hiring people who are chronically unemployed, volunteers in service to America, a community action program, and the Food Stamp Act. Okay, so this is a, a multi-tiered program here um, that Johnson manages to put through. Now, when the election of 1964 comes around, this is actually a very pivotal election when it comes to the way that uh, the U.S. Um, politics dynamic ends up going for the rest of the century leading into the 21st century. It sets brand new precedents here. For one thing, um, this is the emergence of white right wing republicanism. OK, uh, we see uh, the Republican Party finally becoming much more conservative during this time period and the Democratic Party becoming much more liberal. Okay, so this is one of the first elections where these two parties finally start to fall into the categories that we know them to primarily be today. And most of it ends up surrounding uh, the campaign of uh, Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater. Okay, uh, Goldwater is an individual who actually emerges as a right-wing Republican extremist here. Okay, He wins the nomination of the Republican Party, uh, voting against the Civil Rights Act in 1964. And he actually writes a book that he calls The Conscience of a Conservative in 1960, uh, which uh, makes the following um, claims about uh, the Republican Party and about conservatism in the United States. Uh, he wants to end an income tax altogether. He wants to drastically reduce federal entitlement programs is what he calls them. So any kind of welfare programs, social security, anything that can benefit the public themselves. And he says extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. In other words, he's willing to do whatever it takes in the in the recourse of right wing politics to get the job done. OK, and uh, I mean, we've already seen during World War II uh, how right wing extremism could go, how far it can go. And people in the country start to get nervous about Goldwater a little bit. He also advocates bombing North Vietnam, including using nuclear weapons. Okay, we've already discussed the, the potential literal fallout from that. And he says that Johnson's war on poverty is nothing more than a waste of money, okay, that actually attempting to invest in the education and the welfare of the people of the country is a waste of time and effort. He also says that students um, should have to pay for their own education and that the federal government should not allow grants or loans of any kind. Okay, so he's very much embodying uh, an entitled sense of right wing extremism here. And meanwhile, Johnson tries to portray himself as a centrist. Okay, again, kind of taking something of a, a similar stance to what Eisenhower did, right? Trying to do that middle of the road presidency, not really going so far to the left side, but certainly not engaging with the right wing of politics. Uh, as his running mate, he has Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota. And Johnson ends up winning 61% of the popular vote 
and 486 electoral votes. So by a very large margin, Johnson ends up continuing in a second term. Meanwhile, the Democrats gained two Senate seats and 37 House seats. Um, and even though Goldwater ends up losing the election, his support, especially in the South, generates a massive geographical shift to Republicanism in the region, okay? especially as we get into the next couple of decades with uh, Nixon and uh, the reemergence of Republican presidents going into the later part of the 20th century. In May of 1964, Johnson announces uh, the new uh, domestic policy initiative that he refers to as the Great Society. Um, and this is where he says that the federal government has to be the primary means of improving the quality of life for American citizens. Okay. Um, he signs uh, Title VIII of the Social Security Act in 1965. This uh, creates uh, Medicare as a way to get health insurance to the elderly. And Medicaid provides federal grants to states to end up covering medical expenses for the poor and the unemployed. Okay. So Medicare and Medicaid come directly out of Title VIII of Social Security here. The Higher Education Act of 1965 is also created. This is something that increases federal grants to universities, gives quite a bit of a shot in the arm to them. Uh, more scholarships are get granted to low-income students, uh, and there's a lot more low-interest loans for students as, as a result as well. Uh, the National Teacher Corps is created. And the, Nash, the Appalachian Regional Development Act of 1966 extends this war on poverty to the Appalachian Mountain region of the United States, okay, around the Carolinas. Um, this gives $1 billion for programs to um, basically modernize these impoverished areas in the mountains, okay. So it creates, uh, in some cases, hydroelectric dams. It provides electricity, running water. Uh, in some cases, changes the ecology of the region, floods certain valley regions, creates greater lakes and so forth. So um, ends up changing things, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. And the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1965 uh, gives $3 billion to urban renewal projects. Okay, So trying to um, basically uh, improve areas in what are um, primarily considered ghettos and inner cities. A uh, lot more uh, funding from the government to help low-income families end up paying rent. So kind of an office of welfare starts to gain more traction here. And the Housing and Urban Development Department is created as well. Okay, Robert Weaver uh, is actually the, the head of this uh, in the first iteration. Uh, and in total, 435 uh, Great Society bills are sent through Congress uh, while Johnson is in office. Okay, So he actually is working very hard to put a lot of this stuff through. When it comes to immigration and voting rights in the United States, uh, again, Johnson tries to play for political brownie points more than anything else. Uh, he passes the Immigration and National Nationality Services Act of 1965. Uh, this is supposed to abolish any kind of uh, annual quotas when it comes to um, uh, foreign nationalities who are immigrating to the United States. In other words, you can't put any kind of um, immigration ceiling uh, based on racist practices or discriminatory practices. So it creates a few more hemispheric ceilings when it comes to issued visas. So if an individual uh, from a foreign country has a visa to enter the United States, the government basically says we have to set a limit on how many people can come in annually, but we're not going to do it based on racial practices. Okay. So 175 or 170,000 people can come from outside the Western Hemisphere to the U.S., 120,000 from the Western Hemisphere, from South America, and so forth can come. And no more than 20,000 can come from any one country in a single year, okay, so just to try to spread it out. In 1965, Martin Luther King organizes an effort to try to register 3 million unregistered black voters in the South, okay, um, and Lyndon Johnson announces in February that he's going to urge Congress to sign a voting rights bill to try to go along with what Martin Luther King is doing. On February 10th, MLK and several activists converge on Selma in Alabama. Okay, and there's only uh, 250 black um, citizens in uh, in the region of 15,000 eligible voters who are actually registered. Okay, so he's trying to go in and actually help them register physically. Um, 
In March, 600 black and white protesters assembled near the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma uh, to march 54 miles to Montgomery, and they met with a lot of opposition from local police departments. Okay. Uh, 500 state troopers end up assaulting the protesters. They use tear gas, clubs, bull whips. Uh, 50 people are injured in the in the aftermath. Okay. Um, and finally, Lyndon Johnson really starts to lean on Congress and tells them to make the Civil Rights Act a, a priority. And so the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is pushed through, and it ensures that all citizens have the right to vote. Um, says that the attorney general has the authority to send federal officers into the South uh, to register people in person, uh, and it works to a very great extent. 250,000 people are registered by the end of the year. All literacy tests are banned, and between 1960 and 1968, black voter registration increases from only 14 percent in the country to 53 percent. Okay, so this is a dramatic shift in the right direction. And in the long term, it contributes to a lot more Southern whites leaving the Democratic Party for the Republican Party, uh, unfortunately due to a large wave of white supremacy, and uh, or at least um, uh, support of that. In 1966, though, only 38 of 71 Democratic seats still exist in the House um, and uh, win re-election. So uh, Democrats end up losing a lot more support because a lot more uh, Democratic leaders are defecting to the Republican Party now. And the conservative Republican backlash throughout the 70s and 80s uh, ends up overturning a lot more Great Society programs. Okay, So a lot more of these welfare programs end up going the way of the dinosaur, unfortunately. Overall, though, Great Society programs end up being very beneficial. Okay, Infant mortality rates end up dropping in the country. Uh, more people are completing college. Uh, malnutrition is something that virtually disappears. And there are fewer elderly Americans living in poverty or with, uh, uh, without health care. Okay? So a lot more people have a better quality of life in the country. Now, one of the final major events that occurs during the 1960s, and one of the uh, biggest generational events, especially for the baby boomers, is the Vietnam War. Okay, so we'll talk here in, in the next few slides about how all this ends up escalating, what ends up occurring, uh, and how it ends up bleeding over into the 70s eventually. In August of 1964, the Senate passes something called the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, okay? And this increases the U.S. military presence in Vietnam uh, after the fact, okay? And what it amounts to, what leads to it, is that in the, the days preceding the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, uh, two U.S. warships are attacked up here in the northern part of the map in this area called the Gulf of Tonkin, okay? This is off the coast of North Vietnam. And these two warships claim that they are attacked without provocation by the North Vietnamese. And it ends up uh, coming out in the public over time that this is actually a false report, that the U.S. ships actually fired first, and that the South Vietnamese uh, end up supporting attacks on North Vietnamese islands. Okay, So the U.S. are actually the aggressors in this case. And this particular resolution is something that empowers Lyndon Johnson to take greater action against armed attacks and to escalate U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Now, Lyndon Johnson takes the approval by Congress for the Tonkin Gulf Resolution as a, a way of saying, well, if they're approving this resolution, then they are approving a declaration of war. In February of 1965, the Viet Cong end up attacking the U.S. base near Pleiku in South Vietnam, okay, somewhere over here, right around where the map legend, uh, let's see here, um, uh, I believe, I can't remember exactly where it is here, it's right around where the words South Vietnam are on the map. Uh, over 100 Americans are killed or wounded in this particular attack in Pleiku, uh, and uh, Johnson ends up approving something called Operation Rolling Thunder, and this is a, a sustained U.S. bombing campaign in North Vietnam, okay? Um, and in the course of this war, there are actually two different um, fronts that are actually fought, okay? When it comes to North Vietnam, there really aren't any major ground uh, assaults that occur by U.S. forces. It's actually a continual aerial bombing of North Vietnam, but most of the actual uh, on-the-ground soldier movements occur in South Vietnam, 
Okay, so again, North Vietnam is the U.S. bombing. Uh, South Vietnam is most of the ground combat. So Apocalypse Now and all the actual dramatizations you see, all those are supposed to take place in South Vietnam. Uh, General William Westmoreland is put in charge of U.S. forces. He greets the first American combat troops in Vietnam in March, and he chooses that he is going to wage a war of attrition against the Vietnamese, okay? So against the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. Uh, he's going to use firepower to cause extensive casualties and basically try to drain them of supplies, try to force them into giving up. And in South Vietnam, of course, the, the soldiers who were actually transported there are given the, uh, the charge to search and destroy. Okay? And that's what becomes the, uh, the key feature of ground movements of troops during the Vietnam War. Okay? Is anytime you see this happening in a film or a dramatization of some kind, it's usually a search and destroy mission. Find the enemy and kill them. Okay? Problem, though, of course, in, all, in the midst of all this, is that the Viet Cong in particular are able to blend in with all civilians. Okay? And so this is what leads to so many soldiers eventually over time developing a sense of paranoia and engaging in massacres. Uh, a lot of soldiers end up worrying so much that the enemy is hiding in plain sight, um, and the fact that in some cases uh, the Viet Cong will actually uh, uh, recruit women and children to actually engage in war with them. Okay? Sometimes the Viet Cong will attach uh, grenades to a young child and then send the young child running toward U.S. forces. Okay? U.S. soldier might think the child is harmless and the child suddenly explodes in their face. Okay? So as horrible as this is, this was a reality. Um, and the, the body count of the Viet Cong was reported on the nightly news every evening in the United States. Okay, so this is something where a running tally is being kept um, by the U.S. media. And the U.S. casualties of soldiers are being reported on a weekly basis. Okay, um, and unfortunately the numbers continue to rise pretty substantially because, again, most soldiers are not trained for jungle warfare. Okay, there are a few soldiers who are still World War II veterans, to be sure, um, who may have fought uh, in the Philippines, perhaps in the, the Pacific theater, but most of these are young baby boomers who are college students, right? Who may have, uh, you know, been flunking in their grades. They may have been drafted. They're not experienced soldiers, okay? So this is potentially the worst environment to send them to. And again, the Viet Cong men and women do not wear any uniforms. They can uh, blend into the background, hide in plain sight, um, and disappear without a trace. Okay, they actually have several tunnel systems that exist in South Vietnam, um, spider holes, I think is what they're actually called, where um, a small patch of the ground can actually be uh, lifted like a lid and an individual can crawl down inside of a tunnel and seal the opening and it would blend in and you would not be able to see it. Okay. Um, and this is also when minefields are first really used extensively in a Southeast Asian um, theater. Okay, so we start to see areas in uh, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia uh, where uh, several areas are just planted constantly with mines, and individuals are, can very easily run through them, land on them, blow themselves up. Uh, and this is something that bled over from the Korean War as well. The Korean War had this as a, a major feature of it as well. Now, when it comes to Johnson and communism, um, he says that he is committed to the idea of containment, and he says that this is the primary reason why he wants to Americanize the Vietnam War, why he wants us to take a much more direct involvement in the war rather than to scale it back. He wants us to escalate. Okay? And he is worried that because he is involved in it now, he's worried that if he loses uh, Vietnam, if he loses the war somehow, if he loses it to communist forces, then he is going to basically fall into the same category as Harry Truman. Okay, Because Truman in many circles was and is in some cases blamed by Republicans for losing China to communism Okay, because the Chinese Civil War was going on at the same time that this Vietnamese Civil War is going on. And American forces are committed to defeating the Viet Cong in South Vietnam, but without involving China or the Soviet Union. Okay, so this is one of the major uh, limitations of U.S. involvement here, okay, is that the U.S. is not willing to wage what is called a total war, okay, or an absolute war. 
So uh, a lot of military tacticians have said that military victory is never going to be something that was possible for the United States in this case. Okay? We were only willing to fight a limited war because we don't want to involve other countries, uh, whereas the Viet Cong and the communist forces are willing to wage an absolute war, to do whatever it takes to win. And so the U.S. vows to retain a presence in South Vietnam only as long as the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese have the will to fight. Okay? If they give up and they end up signing a peace treaty of some kind, then the U.S. vows to vacate. By 1965, though, in the United States, so many people have come out in opposition to the war that war protests are on the rise. Okay? Uh, in March of 1965, there are 36 different college campuses in the U.S that hold what are called teach-ins, okay? And you see one occurring here at the background. This is a, a, a professor-sponsored educational discourse, okay, where you have a panel of instructors who get up and actually um, discuss the events in Vietnam, field questions from students in the crowd, and as you can tell, it's recorded, okay? And people can actually, um, you know, pose questions and so forth. It's a, it's a public forum is what it amounts to. Um, in April, 20,000 students end up converging on Washington, D.C. and pick up the White House. They protest at the Washington Monument, and they do their best to petition Congress to end the war. Okay. Um, the very following year, Senator William Fulbright, uh, who is the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, begins a congressional investigation into American policy in Vietnam. Is it something that is viable? Can we and should we continue it? And George Kennan, the man who, remember, is the author of the long telegram back during the Truman administration, says that it's an improper uh, idea for us to get involved anymore in Southeast Asia, okay? And that this idea of containment is not something that can be effectively put into practice when it comes to Southeast Asia. There are too many variables, and again, the Vietnamese are willing to wage a total war, and we are not. LBJ, meanwhile, says that his critics are all communists and says that uh, government agencies are going to be used to punish them in one way or another. Okay? So again, he's taking the criticism very personally here. By 1967, though, as many people have seen in mainstream media, uh, in documentaries, in photographs, in dramatizations, anti-war protests are all over the place in the country. Uh, two different uh, camps end up emerging and get their own nicknames. Uh, there are the Hawks, the people who are eager for the United States to go to war and to stay at war, and the Dubs, the people who are eager for peace to happen. Between 1965 and 1968, it's estimated U.S. planes are dropping more bombs on Vietnam than on all enemy targets in World War II combined. And the war becomes a constant drain on funds in the United States, okay? Most of the domestic policy programs that Johnson has constructed in the first few years of his administration are suddenly having funds being siphoned off in order to fund the war in Vietnam, okay? So people in the U.S. are slowly beginning to lose whatever traction and whatever benefits they may have gained from domestic policy because of the war in Vietnam. So this is a large reason why there is such a, a massive wave of protests that occurs against it. Okay? It's not all just about ending war in general. In some cases, it actually directly affects the people here at home. Now, in January of 1968, the first day of the Lunar New Year, which is called Tet in the Vietnamese um, calendar, the Viet Cong unleash a massive surprise attack on U.S. and South Vietnamese forces in South Vietnam. Okay. And the U.S. forces end up retaliating in an event called the Tet Offensive. Okay. And the impact of the Tet Offensive is that this is what turns U.S. public opinion dramatically against the war itself. Okay. Uh, people suddenly think that the U.S. is just uh, taking revenge on the Vietnamese now, okay. and that this war doesn't really have much of a point to it except just going tit for tat here. And so LBJ's popularity suddenly goes into free fall, okay? He becomes more and more embittered, more isolated. He's lashing out at his critics constantly. And again, most of the federal funds for the war on poverty are now being siphoned off and being sent overseas to Vietnam, okay? By 1968, it's an estimated $2 billion per month that is being sent overseas to fund the war in Vietnam. 
And Robert Kennedy, the brother of John F. Kennedy, New York senator here, begins planning his own presidential run to try to uh, supplant Lyndon Johnson and to end the war. And the Minnesota senator, Eugene McCarthy, also begins his own anti-war campaign. Okay? Um, by March 12th, 1968, at the New Hampshire Democratic primary, uh, it's estimated that Lyndon Johnson has gained 48% of the vote, and McCarthy has 42%. Okay, so Lyndon Johnson is already beginning to lose popularity enough that he might not be the front runner for the nomination in the next election. By the end of the month, Lyndon Johnson announces a limited halt to any and all Vietnamese bombing to try to negotiate some kind of ceasefire with the communist forces. And he says that he has decided not to seek re-election, okay? And he will not accept nomination by the Democratic Party just because of the stress and because of the constant uh, need in his own mind for approval, okay? He realizes this is something that he's not going to gain anytime soon. And Kennedy, McCarthy, and now Hubert Humphrey, all are three running against one another for the Democratic ticket. Nineteen sixty eight as a year is potentially the most um, tumultuous year for uh, the United States in terms of the number of people who are lost in terms of the major events that occur uh, both at home and abroad. okay we've already had the Tet offensive uh, we've already had um, the the massive war protests that are occurring at home and again social turbulence comes to an even greater head uh, as the further along we get in the year um, Potentially the biggest event that occurs here happens on April 4th. Uh, James Earl Ray, a white supremacist, ends up assassinating Martin Luther King in the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, the image you see here in the background is was shot immediately in the aftermath of the assassination. Uh, you see King lying on his back here on the balcony right after uh, he was about to give a speech. And immediately, in over 100 cities across the nation, a massive wave of violence and riots ensue. Okay? 46 people are killed in the process, and all but five of them are black. Um, 20,000 army troops and 34,000 National Guardsmen are deployed to try to keep the peace, uh, because everything is suddenly boiling over dramatically here. 21,000 people are arrested. And in June, a Jordanian named Sirhan Sirhan uh, comes out uh, to the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles and assassinates Robert Kennedy. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, Kennedy had just finished celebrating a major victory uh, in the California primary over Eugene McCarthy. It seemed like Kennedy might uh, be able to uh, gain the Democratic nomination for the next election, but unfortunately he was killed before that could happen. Uh, and Sirhan's involvement in this is allegedly over Kennedy's support of Israel. Okay? Sirhan, being a Jordanian, was a member of the Arab League, the uh, group of uh, Arab countries in the Middle East uh, who oppose Israel uh, and, and actually are, uh, want it to be ousted. Kennedy, meanwhile, was uh, buried beside his brother in Arlington National Cemetery just outside of Washington, D.C. And the deaths of these two individuals, right, uh, you know, obviously MLK was the figurehead of the civil rights movement in the midst of all this. Uh, and then, of course, the death of Robert Kennedy, who was potentially uh, the inheritor of John F. Kennedy's legacy. Um, two optimistic leaders uh, being killed in the same year with only a couple of months apart um, it was just a, a massive blow uh, to the optimism of the country. OK, and so most of the rest of the country now becomes more and more embittered and more cynical about the, the role of the government and its ability to protect the people. And so there becomes a larger rise in radicalism, violence, uh, and what the hippies refer to as dropping out of society, removing yourself altogether and pursuing a life based on individual enlightenment rather than trying to change the world. The final series of events we talk about here leads into the election of 1968. By August, the Republicans have gathered in Miami Beach, Florida, and nominate Richard Milhouse Nixon as the next uh, Republican nominee for the presidency. And by this point, Nixon has already got a long track record. We've already discussed it in terms of um, his relationship with Kennedy, uh, and he appoints himself as the spokesman for what he refers to as Middle America, 
He says that he is going to bring law and order to the streets of the country, that he's going to put down all these riots. And he refers to his contingency, the people who support him, as the silent majority. In other words, white moderates who are not willing to engage in politics of any kind. Okay, to basically say the people who are staying out of the protests, who are staying out of all of the, uh, the movements, and the people who in, may, in many ways may either silently support the movements or silently be against them. Okay, the people who are not taking part in this, uh, the people who have removed themselves and are ostensibly neutral. In August, Hubert Humphrey becomes nominated as the Democratic candidate at the Chicago National Convention. And 20,000 anti-war protesters suddenly confront police and National Guardsmen outside. Uh, the riots that ensue thereafter, you see here in the background, are televised. The police use tear gas and clubs once again. Things are boiling over once again. And the Democratic Party ends up fracturing after this. Okay? Uh, George Wallace, who also seeks Democratic nomination here, refusing to move over to the Republican Party side and support Nixon, leaves um, uh, the Democratic Party, Party and runs on the American Independent Party ticket, uh, saying that he is going to defend racial segregation. So we now have Nixon, who is a Republican, uh, Humphrey, who is a Democrat, and Wallace, who is an independent white supremacist. And Wallace also says he's going to try to, quote, get tough on scummy anarchists. He appeals to many people who are the direct and open opponents of war protesters, people who are more right-wing extremists. He hates the welfare system, and he also hates racial integration. So anybody who hates those three things um, ends up coming out in support of Wallace. And unsurprisingly, he gains a lot of support among the white working class members of society. Meanwhile, Nixon and his running mate Spiro Agnew end up winning the election by a very narrow margin, 300 electoral, 302 electoral votes to 191. Okay, so Humphrey would have been the one to gain the most. Wallace only gained 46. And now that Nixon has came, come into office, he makes several promises that in the long run he is not willing or able to fulfill. Uh, he promises peace with honor when it comes to Vietnam and national unification once more. Um, unfortunately for Nixon, his uh, political career becomes very much tarnished by his own lies, by his own underhanded dealings, um, and history has not looked kindly on Nixon ever since. <laughs> 